Hello everyone, my name is Gus. Hi, I'm Woody. Today we have a video of a tragic death, cave diving, cave exploring, actually, uh, in France. And is you know, one of those unfortunate events. Like, I think I always, when I talk to people about how dangerous cave diving is, the reality is, is that a lot of the deaths cave diving are from uncertified people that go into caves and they get lost and drown, right? It's rare that you hear of a death of somebody like, you know, like Brett Hemphill, for example, from, from KUR. It is rare that you hear of deaths like that. Um, most of the deaths are, are unrelated to cave diving. They just happen to dive in a cave, but they were not cave divers. This one is not one of those. This one was a legit cave diver who had an incident in a cave, unfortunately died in France. Mm. And because there's survivors, right, his body survived, we have a kind of event of what happened, and we get to react to that today. Okay. But just to set the stage, because I didn't, we're not reacting to the whole video, all right? If you want a link to the entire video, it's in the description. We always have the link to the source. Um, you can watch the whole thing. But basically, three guys, John, John, and Charles, I believe, three guys are cave exploring in this cave in France, who is, which the water is frigid. 365 days a year, the water is 42. Mm. Very, very cold. Nobody understands why. It can be like hot outside, but the water is frigid. So not a lot of exploration have been done here. I think two expeditions, one laid like, I think it was three or 400 feet of line. That was it. Mm. Then the second one laid to like 1,500 feet or something. And then these guys were going back to lay even more. Okay. But it's a tight squeeze. Mm. So it's a tight cave. And that's, I'm just setting that up because we're jumping in the video like five minutes in, that kind of thing. Okay. The three friends expedition into the cave steps would be fraught with danger at every turn. By the way, one of the Johns, the John that survived, is John Volanthan, who's a legend in the cave diving community and was one of the two main divers that rescued the Thai cave kids. Mm. So it was Rick Stanton and John Volanthan. They were the two guys. So if you watch any of the movies, there's a John. That's this John. This guy. The narrow, shallow passages presented a treacherous challenge with the ever-present risk of damaging crucial equipment. In an environment where every inch and every second counted, these constricted pathways significantly impeded the possibility of a swift retreat in case of an emergency. On the eve of this fateful dive, John Manili faced grave concerns from his friends and fellow divers, John Blanton and Charles Reed Henry. They warned him about the considerable size of his rebreather, underscoring the severe impracticality and inherent danger of using such bulky equipment in the cave's more restrictive and perilous sections. Do we know what kind of rebreather, by chance? I don't remember if they if they okay. talked about the kind of rebreather, but I think it was a back-mounted rebreather. Okay. And, you know, when you're squeezing through stuff, having anything on your back limits what, what you can squeeze through. As a matter of fact, you and I have explored caves in Mexico where the end of the line was at a place where you could still keep going because we were in side mount rebreathers and side mount tanks versus the original explorers that could only go up to that point because it got too small. And then you and I continued past the end of the line uh, exploring new passages because of the equipment that we have. So the concerns they have are valid. We do think about that. What kind of equipment do you have? Can you fit through it? And um, you know, these guys apparently had that concern. Yet, Manili, in a move marked by recklessness, chose to disregard these warnings, emboldening himself to confront the cave's looming threats with gear ill-suited for its harsh realities. Mm. Adding a layer of peril to this already dangerous endeavor was Manili's compromised physical state. I want to talk about this for a second, because I think it came up during the incident that we had in Abaco, right? Where it was like, well, if you knew that the hole was too small, why do you go anywhere? Why do you even try it? So... As cave divers, you find yourself in a lot of in a lot of situations where the you have to squeeze through something small. We've done this before at the Diamond Sands restriction, a jug hole. We did this to go to Woody's room, pretty tight squeeze. I mean, it happens sometimes. Most of the time, the caves are pretty big. You're not squeezing through anything. The videos that people watch of people like fighting, like no mount to get through stuff, that's not very common. It doesn't happen a lot. But sometimes you will find areas that are small. And the only way to find out if you fit is if you try. The reason why I always say that I prefer cave diving to caving, just regular, you know, um, 
uh, dry caves is because you don't have to deal with gravity falling into a hole that you can't climb out. Imagine falling into a hole where you can move your arms and legs. You will die there. Like it happens to John Jones and the Naughty Putty Cave, for example. He fell head first into a hole and they couldn't pull him out. In cave diving, you're underwater. There's no gravity. You're neutrally buoyant. So you go in, you get stuck, you try, and then you pull back. It's rare that you're going to get stuck and stuck in a way that not even your bodies, nobody can, nobody can get you out. I mean, you did something very wrong if you get stuck to that point, right? I agree. And But that particular passage that you're talking about that we didn't get through, yeah, that was our fault. I was all. I really yeah. think back and I look as all we would have had to I do is go possible. to the right. Yeah, and we would have. We were just too far left. But I saw in the video that you showed. Yeah, uh, I guess I. It was me. Maybe there was plenty more room on the right. It was you and me, both of us. If I would have just moved it. over to the right. Yeah. Boop. Got we could have made it. So put it in perspective that. It wasn't that it was so tight. Everybody that was yeah. criticizing us. You have a right to do that. Yeah. It's that we just. Did it wrong. Yeah. And people were saying like, well, Brian already told you that nobody in a sidewinder had made it through. Why do you, why do you go? Well, because that's part of being a cave diver. Like if you're unwilling to try new things, then cave diving might not be for you. But and by the way, he had a way just, just yeah. to remind it. I don't remember if this was in the video. He briefed us that it's no problem, guys. I could come around and get you and pull you right out. Right. So this isn't a risk because right. I have another way of getting you. He, but that that was I think we left that off the video, by the way. Yeah, but the point Should've is said that. The point is there's a lot of situations where you as a cave diver find yourself in, in, in stuff like that. And then you add the level of comfort that you have removing gear to make it through. We have divers, you know, friends of ours, like Doug Ebersole, for example, who says his limit is removing gear. He's like, if I have to remove tanks and things to get through that restriction, that's my limit. I don't want to do that. It's not that he's unable to do it. He can do it better than us, probably. But he just doesn't want to do it. He's like, to me, cave diving is fun. And the idea of having to remove gear to fit through a hole doesn't sound fun to me. To, mo to other people, they crave it. Other people, you know, friends that we have, like Benjamin, for example, he, he Take looks... Take off everything. <laughs> like, can we go to a place where I have to, right. to get naked to get through, right? <laughs> uh, there's people like that. There's all kinds of people in cave diving. I think for me and you, probably, we have, like, within reason, like, can we remove a tank and put it back on? Yeah. It does, it's not crazy. It's but, about by One tank, yeah, maybe. But it. removing my whole rebreather? No. I don't think I'm willing Zero to Zero chance I'm doing I, It just doesn't sound fun. Can I do it? Sure. Can I, in an emergency, if I have to take off my whole rebreather? Sure. And I think there's a there's an advantage to not removing gear and fitting through restrictions is that you can always remove gear to get out. If getting out is tougher or if you're in an emergency. So like if I go in with both tanks on me, I know that taking one off will make it easier to fit through the same hole. So I always have that in mind. But if you struggle to get through, no mount, meaning nothing on your body and you struggle, dude, getting out is going to be potentially way worse. Definitely. So this guy, he was briefed on it. They said, look, the exploration from what we've learned in the past is pretty tight. That rebreather on your back is pretty big. Are you sure about this? He can make a calculation. There's no daredevil thing. This is just, yeah, I've maybe I've done it before. I've taken my rebreather and put it back on before. I'm good. And his body's trusted him, you know? So it's not out of the ordinary. I don't want anyone watching this to be like, this guy was nuts. No, there's a lot of cave divers who remove gear to get through stuff. It's common. He bore the lasting scars of a severe back injury from a motorcycle accident in 1998, an injury that had not just left him with physical marks, but also persistent limitations. This critical aspect of his condition, often overlooked, became a pivotal factor in the events that unfolded. The injuries severely curtailed his maneuverability, especially in the cave's tight, unforgiving passages that demanded the utmost agility and flexibility. As the three friends would have to delve deeper into the cave system, the combination of the challenging environment, the bulky equipment, and Manili's physical limitations created a scenario fraught with danger. The cave's claustrophobic passages became a gauntlet barely wide enough to allow passage. Each move carried weight in the hostile underground world, and the shadow of potential catastrophe loomed large over the journey. Beneath a modest 12 by 16 foot or 3 by 4 meter opening, the beginning of the cave plummets to a daunting 5 meters. Divers five begin meters? their descent daunting through a vertical meters. crack, what? or known as S1, leading to the ominous edge of a shaft called S3. 
The cave's complex layout includes several chimney halls, dropping to a chilling 215 feet or 65 meters. That's that's deep. Deep. A hazardous passage, widened yet treacherous, lies 541 feet 165 meters beneath S3. The journey beyond is marked by poor visibility, dense sediment, and the challenges of navigating with scooters. The fissure's floor, strewn with sharp fossil-rich boulders, leads to a constricted passage culminating in a disturbance zone at 1,800 feet 555 meters, that descends into a steep gravel-filled corridor. This formidable cave stretches over 4,576 feet, 1,400 meters, that looks awesome. presenting a harrowing <laughs> challenge to even the most skilled cave Did divers. It well. Yeah. On September 28, 2008, the expedition commenced with John Manili, John Valanthin, and Charles Reed Henry to explore the source of Dudube. Embracing the practice of autonomous diving, each member ventured into the cave's depths independently, facing the unknown without mm. the aid of a team. Mm. The entrance to the cave presented the first test of their resolve. Buried with a cumbersome rebreather, John Manili cautiously navigated the confined space. Every move was measured, as the risk of entrapment in such tight quarters was a constant threat. Approximately 13 meters into the dive, John encountered the upper ledge of the shaft, known as S2. Descending into S2 was like plunging into an abyss. The water turned icy and pitch black, forcing him to rely solely on his flashlights to pierce the engulfing darkness. The shaft's mechanical descent tested his skills and nerves as he made his way deeper. I love it how they sensationalized this for like... To create like some kind of in the pitch blackness of this watery hole require an you know a light. artificial source of light. Oh, so he used a flashlight in a cave. I mean, so like Jenny Springs. Just keep it real. Like I mean, you know, there's no cave. need. It's a cave. The chilling waters and the oppressive darkness created a sense of claustrophobia. The cave walls looming ominously close. Every oh. decision John made carried weight as a single misstep could lead to a catastrophe. The cave's depths were unforgiving and the complexity of the environment demanded constant vigilance. By the way, I hate it when people that don't know anything about cave diving talk about cave diving like one mistake and you're dead. It's not like that. We carry backups over backups. Like the minimum, just to pick lights because we were talking about lights, the minimum amount of lights we take is three. And most of us carry four or more sometimes because you have two in the helmet, one in your hand, two in your pockets. And that is if your primary fails, you go to the secondary. If you drop your secondary into an abyss, you go to the tertiary and then your body has three more. Like there's so much backup that it, this whole notion that you make one move and you're dead, like that's just not a thing in cave diving. Not a thing. We have catastrophic rebreather failures, meaning you have a rebreather and it completely fails and you can make it up. So, yeah, this is just nonsense. The underwater passage was a labyrinth with each twist and turn holding potential dangers from sudden drop-offs to narrow bottlenecks that could easily ensnare John. The chilling silence of the cave so was, was cave. broken only by the sound of his breathing and the bubbles rising from his rebreather. As he ventured what? further, the cave's claustrophobic grip tightened. There's no bubble. The passage narrowed and the sediment-strewn floor became more treacherous, with jagged rocks and boulders lurking in the shadows. The cave's environment was a constant battle against the elements. The cold water was sapping his strength and the narrow passages demanded precision. I'm not really I'm not really focused on this guy's words to be perfectly yeah. honest i'm just looking for the facts and i'm i don't know if this if this i think they said this is actual footage so if you well, notice i'm not commenting a lot because i don't this think guy's an entertainer accident, no. we've been we we, we we certainly are entertainers sure i'm not overly critical of the fact that he's way blowing this out of proportion and way i mean saying a lot of things that aren't right i've said a lot of things that aren't right you have at times as well rebreathers yeah. Definitely should not be bubbling, right? We should. Right. I could have paused and said that. So let's, we'll leave that alone. Right. And now I'm trying to focus on the facts of you know what happened here and go from that. In the darkness, challenging his senses, like every that. meter he descended like took him further from the safety of the surface, no, deeper into hard. the heart of the cave. <laughs> As he progressed, the cave's features became more daunting. The stalactites and went. stalagmites formed the less eerie shapes he was in going. the beam of his lights. <laughs> The water's chill penetrated his wetsuit, reminding him of the cave's indifference to human presence. 
As John Manili descended deeper into the source of Dudu, the environment transformed into a more menacing and constricted labyrinth. The more he looked down, the less he looked up. At 1,056 feet, 322 meters, the shaft's descent became steeper. To chat GBT, help you write this, <laughs> like, please write a description, a narrative of the most dangerous and adjectives you can use to describe cave diving and then you know chap gbt like I, i'm gonna do it while you're playing and this. when he stopped Watch kicking this. i'm gonna do it I'm his gonna do legs it. were moving i'm gonna do it and read it and then see what I, wine comes up with all right it I'll led him to an now. ominous more giant obstruction hole its mouth cluttered with chunky blocky materials to the Known right of the shaft rocks. floor a narrow crevice beckoned <laughs> leading to an Known uphill cave rocks. passage this area was fraught with challenges. A significant sediment accumulation resulted in intense turbidity, clouding John's vision and complicating navigation. Yeah, this is the water, thick with particulate matter, Nobody created a like disorienting this. murky veil, demanding the utmost concentration and skill to proceed. Despite the conditions, John's resolve remained unshaken. The underwater realm fueled his determination with its dark. Oh, it ChatGPT loves the word realm. <laughs> I that's, can tell you that. That's that, a pedal tale, yeah. It does. Watch <laughs> this. Deep beneath the surface of the ocean, hidden from the prying eyes of the world above, lie the treacherous and forbidding underwater caves. What? Chat GBT is busy writing <laughs> the most scary description of caves right now. Dive so talk we tales. This. We could do one. You and I want. <laughs> all right. All right. All right? The walls of the underwater caves are jagged and unforgiving. I, we oh may have called God. this guy out. This is exactly yes. <laughs> <laughs> As you oh. navigate through the labyrinth tunnels, the sense of claustrophobia <laughs> intensifies. Dude, <laughs> did you chat GBT this? I'm just saying. I'm just... <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to call that out. I could I just oh, knew it. Oh, I knew no. I know the words. The passage of time becomes distorted in the depths of these underwater caves. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making it up. Look, it's typing this. It's, is it's exactly, typing it. This is it. Oh no. <laughs> yes. Dude, that's all you is need. That there? So to if tell you stories. Dare, if you dare to venture into the depths. Prepare yourself for a journey into the heart of darkness. <laughs> it goes on and on. It's perfect. This Dude, is right. uh, I feel so that. Sorry. I feel, I feel bad. It's okay. This guy died. And but this that this, but we I just couldn't help it. <laughs> that's it. That's how this is done. Absolutely. Oh. Now you know. Navigating through the cave, John encountered a passage on the left, a mm. gateway to a further valley side corridor. The narrow and treacherous Gateways passage my... had been slightly expanded in 2002, yet remained a daunting challenge. With seasoned expertise, John meticulously maneuvered through the claustrophobic route. Yeah, it likes His the word daunting. movement, saying, calculated and deliberate. Yeah, that's the it. confined yeah, space demanded exceptional control and awareness, as any misstep oh, could lead funny. to entrapment or equipment failure. Monitoring his depth gauge and air supply with unwavering attention, John advanced through the passage and commenced directly below into the shaft floor of S3. The, the once open hall had succumbed to a collapse, burying its initial 98 feet or 30 meters and I transforming know. it into a treacherous maze of debris and tight squeezes. After covering a daunting distance of approximately 1,821 feet or 550 meters, GBC he arrived at the word. first major fold well. zone, yep. a geological challenge marked by steep slopes and unpredictable terrain. Angling sharply downward, the passage was lined with accumulations of gravel banks, remnants of ancient underwater currents, now silent and still. The gravel banks, right. a labyrinth of natural barriers, impeded his progress, forcing him to navigate cautiously. Dude. The loose gravel and the steep Our incline GPT created a treacherous it landscape where really every movement could some... trigger a cascade, altering the cave's delicate equilibrium. As John delved deeper, the cave's confining walls seemed to close around him, creating a palpable sense of claustrophobia. The limited space combined with the sheer depth he had reached underscored the risks of his solitary endeavor. His this air supply, a lifeline so in the submerged world, like was dwindling. And he was acutely oh, aware of its preciousness. You want me to read all of mine? Adhering we to the rule of thirds, a critical safety protocol in cave diving, John calculated his oh, air reserves, go. ensuring he retained enough for a mm. safe ascent. In scuba diving, particularly in overhead environments like caves so and wrecks, okay, the rule of thirds is a critical guideline for gas management. That's right. It mandates that divers allocate one-third of their gas supply for the onward journey. Yeah, but... 
he was on a rebreather. So the rule of thirds is not... Well, for bailout, it does apply. For bailout, but it's not as applicable, meaning it's not a- applicable in the way he's talking about rule of thirds. It is true. When you dive in rule of thirds, meaning you're open circuit, you use a third of your air to penetrate the cave and a third of your air to come out, leaving a third for emergencies. But because you're on a rebreather, you're not using that air. The air you would use if you need to bail out, meaning catastrophic rebreather failure, you don't have a rebreather anymore. Now the gas is to get out. So your entire bottle, not one third, two thirds, th- the whole thing is to get out of the cave. So the rule of thirds doesn't really apply the way he's describing it to the type of diving John is doing. Yeah, we're going to plan our bailout gasp as if we had a catastrophic rebreather failure in the worst place we could in the cave so in other words what we do is we plan on a rebreather how much penetration how deep back are we going to go into the cave from the entrance based on the gas we're carrying and our surface air consumption rate of uh, you individually yeah would that be an and we we buffer that as well. We usually multiply that by one and a half. And we even factor in maybe for the first three minutes, we're going to have a CO2 hit. So we're going to be breathing fast. So we we, we plan that we have enough gas to get out yeah, of we, that emergency. That's kind of how we do it on a rebreather. Yeah. As an example, uh, if our surface rate consumption is 0.4 cubic feet per minute, we calculate it out of one. That's 2.5. Exactly. So it's way, way conservative. Another third for the return and reserve the final as a crucial safety margin. The rule is essential. But he was diving with is not an option. Divers that divers are on must open circuit trace their path to I, exit. I think they're diving with a buddy, all in especially oh. one with a higher gas consumption then rate. That wasn't the real third video. Is often based on the buddy supply, necessitating an earlier turnaround or carrying The footage that he's talking about is footage from that cave, but it's not footage from the incident. Got it. Carrying extra gas for safety. This cautious approach ensures a safe return ben from these boss. treacherous underwater environments. As he prepared for return to the entrance of the cave, he felt good that he made it this deep into the passages, but due to his air running low, he knew he needed to get out. Retracing his path, John faced the obstacles he had navigated on his descent. Each twist and turn of the cave was a puzzle, demanding meticulous attention and skill. The journey back was as much a mental challenge as a physical one. Each stroke took him closer to safety, but the oppressive darkness and the knowledge of the cave's hidden dangers weighted heavily on him. The return swim was a race against time and his dwindling air reserves. Navigating through the cave's claustrophobic passages with a cumbersome rebreather presented a formidable challenge. The precariously positioned boulders could easily become dislodged, transforming the route into a perilous trap. John was aware of this, but he continued to push. The end of the S2 section posed a formidable challenge, strewn with large boulders that created a series of tight squeezes. Maneuvering through this section was a delicate balance of technique and caution. The tight confines of the underwater labyrinth seemed to constrict around him, leaving little room for maneuver. To alleviate his struggle, John made a critical decision that would soon escalate into a dire situation. He chose to remove his rebreather, a decision that Mm. under the circumstances seemed necessary but was fraught with risk. Squeezing through the narrow gap without the bulk of a rebreather, he relied on an alternate air source, a bottle he held under his arm. This temporary solution, however, brought its own set of dangers. The cave's oppressive walls, unyielding and close, pressed in on him, exacerbating the difficulty of his movements. His pre-existing back injury from 1998 further complicated his situation, making it impossible to put on the rebreather again in such confined quarters. Yeah. Faced with limited options and a rapidly deteriorating situation, John decided he needed to move faster to head back to the surface. Navigating the torturous path with the air bottle tucked under his arm. The ascent, however, took a treacherous turn. Suddenly, the bottle detached from the rubber hose of his mouthpiece, leaving him in a serious predicament far from the cave's entrance. So So I'm so lost. Wait, with the mouthpiece... So the stage... The second stage came apart from the hose? I mean, that would just be spewing gas everywhere. Is that that, uh, that what you understand? I mean, do you know the facts? But before that, before that... Okay, so he gets he's on a rebreather. He gets to a restriction. He decides, I'm not going to be able to fit unless I take it off. But once he took it off, he didn't stay in the loop and swim no, his rebreather like in he front. Didn't. He just took the whole thing off to, like, push the rebreather, and then he was he bailed out, I he guess? He used his bailout gas. That's what yeah. it sounds like. 
So if he, that's right. So he went to a bell. I guess he closed the loop. He's pushing the rebreather through the hole, and he's bailed out. And then in that process, maybe the bottle got caught and it ripped the mouthpiece out of his. Maybe the mouthpiece. I don't think it was the second stage. Maybe okay. the mouthpiece came off, which okay. has happened. It happened to me too. He can just yeah. come off of the mm-hmm. right, and now that's a problem. That I guess that's what's happening. But why would you take your whole rebreather and not stay on the loop? Like you can swim it in front of your face. There's no chance yeah. I would take off my re- a sidewinder. Yeah. To take that thing well, off. Well, he was in a back cave. mounted like a spear. I get anywhere. it. But let me just explain that. You said, sure, you could take off your sidewinder in a cave. That's a lot of work. I'm not going to be that bold. I don't know if I could take off my sidewinder in a dry suit. It's so configured and a part of my body. I don't know if I could do that in a cave. Mm-hmm. I, I, I honestly don't think I could. It's it's difficult. And you would have to, I guess, keep the bailout bottles together with a unit because they're hanging out of the yeah. webbing of the of the wing. Yeah. Boy. I it would be very complicated. It'd be really it's possible, tough. but it would be it would be complicated. But I would try to stay on the loop. If I have I mean, to take maybe it off. in a pool, you and I one time we'll try, try let's to get all off. rigged out with our side mount, you mm-hmm. know, tanks on and try without Anybody helping you take off that entire sidewinder? I just don't think I can do it. It will be a I'm challenge. I'm calling myself out. I yeah. really don't. I'm thinking about it more and more. I don't yeah. think I could. That could be a good Stranded challenge. without an air supply in the suffocating embrace of the underwater cave, panic set in. In a frantic and desperate search, John attempted to retrieve the lost air bottle, but his efforts were in vain. The murky waters in the tight space hampered his movements, turning the cave into a disorientating, treacherous maze. As the precious seconds ticked away, the lack of oxygen began to take its toll on John. His breaths became shallow, his movements sluggish, and his vision blurred. The cave transformed from a challenging dive site into a nightmarish trap in these harrowing moments. The darkness of the surroundings, the weight of the water above, and the daunting realization of his predicament converged, creating an overwhelming sense of dread. As oxygen deprivation intensified, John's struggle reached a critical point. His consciousness began to slip away, succumbing to the suffocating grip of hypoxia. Isolated and helpless, far from the safety of the surface and trapped within the unyielding confines Hmm. of the cave, he faced the stark reality of his circumstances. Okay, so if I, so again, I'm just trying to replay this. So you're you're in a in a in a situation where it's so small that you had to remove your rebreather and push it through, and then the mouthpiece falls off and maybe the regulator goes somewhere. And because you're so stuck, you can't really get it back. Like I've been in situations like that. You probably have too, where you're like, like your hands are so caught that you couldn't get it back. But even though you're drowning there because you're not breathing, what hypoxia, what are you talking about? That made no sense. <laughs> it just, it just made no sense. I, I don't know why hypoxia would be a part of that conversation on an open chat GPT while on an open circuit. Cause he's bailed out. Yeah. That's just chat GPT adding I, that shouldn't terms for no reason. Yeah. So I he, mean, hypoxia, you, if you did get hypoxia chat GPT, since you wrote this, <laughs> you're right. You would slowly go new into a state of unconsciousness. Right. But this although guy that's not, not applicable hypoxia. here, I no. don't think no. So I think, yeah, so what happened is he if the second stage came off or the mouthpiece came off and he doesn't have any more air, then I can see how, I mean, you start drowning immediately. But you don't have time to, like, shallow breaths. And he, yeah, in the, the shadow, fuck. in the shadow of the cave, he contemplated his life and life choices. He, come on. I'm going to get mine out again. It's, it's just, like, I what are you talking amazing... about? He was, dry, he was drowning. All right. Passage what? of time. Okay, the passage of time becomes distorted in the depth of these <laughs> underwater caves. Minutes feel like hours and hours start to feel like eternity. <laughs> Your sense become heightened every sound and movement magnified as if the very essence of fear has seeped into John's bones. Okay. That's, that's who wrote it. That, it you know that's, that's who wrote better. It. That's better than what he well, said. Mine's a little more dramatic, but I... <laughs> It's just that's who wrote this. All right, I so feel bad. I don't Hold think ChatGPT knows the facts of this situation. You're making me laugh with Sh- ChatGPT, and people are gonna say that I have no dignity. No, I don't I care know. about John's family. Well, I, I do. I, I just want to get to the ridiculous. facts, right? And I don't think Chat knows it. 
No. No disrespect to John Manley. A diver alone in the depths. Manley. Confronted Manley. by the unrelenting and indiscriminate force of nature. A dire situation was unfolding in the depths of See? the source to do dube. John Manley's diving partners, John Belanthan and Charles, emerged from the cave only to be confronted by their friend's absence. Man. As time ticked by with no sign of John, a feeling of impending doom enclosed them. Concern mounted rapidly, transforming into a tangible fear yeah. for his well-being. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, they urgently called for emergency services, their minds racing with worry. Resolved to leave no stone unturned, John Belanthan and Charles decided to plunge back into the cave's claustrophobic maw in a desperate search for John. The cave, a silent and unyielding entity, seemed wow. to echo their concern as they reached the path they had previously taken. Their worst nightmares materialized when they stumbled upon a heart-wrenching scene. John's lifeless body lay trapped wow, under a ledge in the main shaft of the cave at a depth of 85 feet or 26 meters. It was too late. John had succumbed to the dangers of the cave. So basically, since we don't Terrible. actually know the facts here, he just got wedged in somewhere. Is that what you understand? And they found him with his rebreather off. I'm asking you because I, I, I don't know. know the facts. I know. I, all I know is the video. You know, okay, I haven't okay, I haven't researched okay. this incident. Sometimes you do. So I wasn't sure if you knew. No, no, no. And I, I wish, you know, if I knew that John Valanthan was part of it, I would have reached out and get some more facts from him. Maybe have him on the show and, and, and uh, talk to us about about what happened, if he's willing to talk about it. I don't know. I'm just, yeah. you know, um, thinking. But it seems to me and I, I have to go back and read it, but it seems to me like he removed his rebreather. He lost control of it. Like maybe he went away from him. And then the second stage that he was breathing out, the mouthpiece came off or something broke and then he drowned. That's what it sounds to me because he didn't say he was found with his rebreather on. He was found whatever. He was just, he, he drowned. You but know? I, I do think, unfortunately. The, yeah. And my comment though, is that look, I've talking to Ed Sorensen about this and he, I really respect him on this. You don't need to how, – how does he word it to me? You, you, don't, you don't have this incredible skill set after some number of cave dives that you think you have. Right. Until you've been in a really bad situation. Yeah. And so Ed is always telling me, like, we'll talk about stuff like this. Like, why do this? You know, don't do that unless you're with somebody else. And these guys, by the way, are very experienced. So I'm not I'm not saying it about Absolutely. them. I'm not saying it about them. I'm yeah. saying it about me. Yeah. I can talk about myself. I don't want to do that stuff. Right. Because I don't feel like I have that skill set. I don't. I'm not taking off my rebreather in a cave. There's different levels of cave divers. I've you you've agreed with me on this. Absolutely. I I like cave diving. I do. It's fun. It's a sense of exploring. But I'm not Mike Young and Ed and Brian. Right. And I don't want to be. I'm not looking to get to their level. Right. I want to be cruising around on my dpv i want the privilege of seeing what brian will show us just some absolutely spectacular case but 99 percent of my cave diving is already explored passage mm -hmm. with very experienced uh cave divers that are basically yeah. taking me around so i kind of call myself a recreational cave diver yeah and um i don't think unless you are with somebody that's training you to do this kind of stuff, you know, you want to do anything close to this as a relatively new cave diver, whatever that definition of relatively new is. I'm, I'm, I don't cave dive that often. I would never do something like this. I do agree with Doug more and more. I don't know if I'm going to be doing stuff where I got to take stuff off. It's, it's not that exciting to me. Yeah. I'd rather just get on those new, sea crafts we had where you sometimes you're leading it you took me through those cool passages and we're having a blast yeah i cave dive to have fun i know you i think are enjoying more and more some of the the cave exploration stuff and that's great yeah but, but you're still, doing we do it, it we you're do doing it with, it with a mentor people. you're doing it with mike who's showing right. you what to do and right that's it's admirable different. that's admirable it's different um but yeah i mean truly really, um tragic that yeah. john manili when 
to explore in this cave. And unfortunately, he paid the ultimate price, um, you know, dying, uh, trying to explore it. Of course, nobody goes into these dives thinking they're going to die or that anything wrong is going to happen. You prepare for it and you make an educated decision. So I would hate for anyone to think that, oh, this is this Darwin Award. And like this guy was, you know, crazy going in. No, no, no. These are very experienced divers that made a calculated risk. And sometimes things don't work out. I mean, that's that's what each one of us going into one of these caves is prepared to accept. You know, it's never 100 percent safe. We've never said the cave diving is 100 percent safe, but you can prepare to make it as safe as possible. Well, said. Um, but again, sometimes you do go through restrictions. And I, I talk about some of the examples that we've been through, like the diamond sand restriction at Jug Hole. We actually recorded this. And in case you haven't seen it, I'm going to leave it right here. Funny enough. In that dive, you had a catastrophic rebreather failure and we had to bail out. Absolutely. So you get both. You get to see two for one. Restriction and catastrophic rebreather failure. And um, one 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 mistake and you didn't die. I made Shocking. chat GPT to write something about that for me. We should. Bye, everybody.